They're called the greatest generation, men and women from all walks of life, who grew up in the Great Depression, led our nation to victory in World War II, and helped make America a beacon of freedom and democracy for all the world. And do they have some stories to tell? I'm pleased to be partnering with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center to preserve the words and memories of many of our World War II veterans. These stories will be entered into the state's archives, where they will be accessible to researchers, academics, and future generations. Our veterans have given so much to help build a brighter future for all Americans. This tribute is just one small way of saying thank you. Now, if we could start, sir, could you spell your first and last name for yes. me? Albert Wygant. Can you spell that? W-Y-G-A-N-T. Some people have a hard job pronouncing it. I don't know why. Because I've been called every name under the sun. Widget, Winnet. So in Boots, we're standing in front of the medical building. We're going to get shots. Okay, so we're standing there. And this instructor, our PO, he's standing up there. And he hollers out my name. And nobody answers. Widget, one net. No answer, no response. W Y G A N T. Here, sir. Why didn't you tell me this? to begin with. And I spoke right up and says, because you didn't pronounce my name right. I got 21 push-ups on the ground. <laughs> True. And then we had a guy who was a joker, and he would, <laughs> uh, he was kind of tall, and this little guy was kind of terrified of the shots, because everybody was giving rumors it's going to be a torpedo needle and all that stuff. So. This little guy walks in, and of course you got two guys, one on each side, and they got these guns. And you're looking at that guy, by the time you're looking at him, you get the other one. Bing, bing, just like that. And they really drive them to it. So anyways, the kid comes out fine. The big guy who had been, right, you know, kidding him, he went and had the shot when he did. He come out, passed right out on the deck. He was just like that. And the little guy just sat there laughing his heart off. Now, Albert, you served in the Navy, right? Yes, I did. Now, where'd you go for your basic? Basic is Samson. Mm -hmm. We served, uh, they had uh, several units in there. They had uh, two sections, top and bottom. Bottom and top, uh, second floor, first floor. Both different sections of guys. And uh, our unit was called G, so we called it the Gestapo unit. So uh, my instructor was a chief in the Navy, PL. He was real muscular. But anyways, 5,000 of us went through that day from all over. And uh, I mean, they were bringing them in by bus load, you know, from Geneva. And uh, Greyhound probably had a franchise at that time because I came by Greyhound. And uh, we got in there, and of course, you get in this one room, and you got a box in front of you. So you strip, you pack all your stuff in the box. Put your name and address on it, that's it. Now you're naked. You go through this whole thing, all different doctors, you know. So anyways, uh, uh, when you're done with that, then you gift your clothing. So you go in front of this guy and he's got like a, a bench in front of him all kinds of clothes up there in the back. So 
just measure your head. And he measured my head, 6.7, 6, 7, 8. I said, okay. And then, uh, what shoe size? I said, 8, sir. 8. Right? So he flings a pair at me, nine and a half. Okay. So uh, we had to try on all the clothing ahead of time. So you tried them on. If it didn't fit, you were supposed to raise your hand. I did. And he said, put your hand down. So through the whole training, I trained with nine and a half shoe. And the end of the shoe was curled right up just like this. I didn't get a decent pair of shoes until I left Samson and went back to the base where I was going. And then I finally went to the PX <laughs> and I got a pair of shoes that fit me. True. 5,000 of us went from after three months of training, <clears throat> we board ship, or board the train, and they had two steam engines. We touched the tip of six different states before we hit Boston. I don't know why. Probably because different guys were going different places. True. And uh, I got, <clears throat> I arrived in Boston approximately about two, two o'clock in the morning. And uh, when we went to New York City, the steam engines had to be disconnected because you couldn't bring steam engines through New York City. So they had to use electric to tow us through and then hook us back up. That was the reason for that. Well, anyways, we got down to Boston and Fargo Barracks. I got in there and of course, no mattress. I'm sleeping on springs. Yeah, but you're so bone tired. I didn't care. No pill, no nothing. Pure springs. You just had the chance to sleep oh, and you were happy. Man, I was I was whipped. I was whipped. So So that was my 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 place where I stayed for approximately three weeks. <clears throat> now previously in Samson, you went before this uh, guy, I call him a professor. And he's like you, he had a little stand in front of him. He had this, this book in front of you. Each page had a different subject, okay? So you would, he'd give you 10 minutes to study this. And then he'd flip to the next one. So then he would ask you uh, questions about each page, you go back. And that way he evaluated what you wanted, what your mind was telling you what you are. I hated shop. I hated wood. But they said I was a carpenter. So that's what they stuck me in, in the Navy, as a carpenter. So what does someone that does carpentry in the Navy do? Carpentry, surprisingly, even though there's steel ships, there's a lot of wood on the modern Navy ships. So you were in charge of making any well, repairs? You know, or I mean, you, you, you had a chair that broke, or uh, a frame of a picture, or a uh, uh, leg on a thing that broke. You had to fix it. So were you on a ship during your whole time when you served during World War II? Yeah. Now, now, now where did your particular ship go? Okay, we didn't, we didn't go nowhere, because I told you it happened. In Fargo Barracks, Okay. We were there waiting for assignment. Okay. So all of a sudden, this morning, we get the call. I said, great, I'm going to go somewhere. So they took us down in Charlestown Navy Yard. And here's this ship. This ship was called Frank Knox. It was a destroyer. Brand new. One of the, all, all your older destroyers had one turret, turret, gun turret in the bow, one in the stern. 
was a single 538 gun. Okay. This Frank Knox came with a double turn in the bow and one turn in the in the stern. So she had six combination guns of 538s. Okay. But what was wrong with her is that she had a degree of lisp like this, a 20% degree. And they couldn't figure out why. Now, I mean, this is a brand new ship, came right from being built. They towed it in by tug, because they didn't use the engines at all. And it was our job, our, our, us guys, to go aboard ship and start getting her ready. Well, we couldn't because she was tilted, and they couldn't figure why. So they finally came up with the answer. What we'll do is we'll take, we'll take everything off the ship that isn't nailed down. Pots, pans, silverware, cups, saucers, whatever. We had to take that, go aboard ship, take that all out. My mom, she's still tilted, okay? Put it on the deck, on the dock, okay? And so that's what we did. They took everything off the ship, and it still didn't correct her. She still had that little lisp to the left, to port side. So anyways, they finally come up with a conclusion that something was radically wrong with the ship, because it was not seaworthy. You couldn't go out to sea with a ship like this. It has to be level to go into the water, into the waves. So anyways, they towed it by tug to South Boston. I don't know what happened to the ship. Us guys were left with all the goodies on the dock. We had to load them on the truck. I don't know what happened to them. And back I went to Fargo Barracks. No ship. So I sit there for two weeks like that. All of a sudden I get some orders. Pack your gear. Now your gear consists of a mattress, your duffel bag, a hammock, the old-fashioned hammocks that they used to have, okay? And what you did is you curled your mattress up, put your duffel bag in the middle, tied it up, secured it. That was 150 pounds. Now it's only one place you can carry it, on your shoulder. True. So I had to pick it up, put it on board the truck. They took me down to Charlestown Navy Yard, and my ship that I had didn't even know about was 10 docks away, 10 piers. So I had to carry this 150, 200, 100, 150 pounds, 10 of blocks. I mean, a distance, maybe a couple of miles. So when I got there, all I saw was this ship. Okay. Now she's docked. Uh, she's docked in the... And I, I look at her, and I couldn't believe it. To me, that's not a fighting ship. It's a sailing ship. What am I doing here? So then I go aboard, and when you go up the gangway, you have a duty officer, permission to come aboard. Grab it. You go aboard, and he assigns you to go down below. So I went down to the gun deck, okay, which was, uh, there I met the, camp, the, the uh, skipper and, uh, and this chief. This chief was called from retirement because they didn't have trained personnel that knew enough. This guy had so many hash marks on his sleeve that they were all the way up to here that he had a hard job saluting because, every, I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Each one of them had so many years. And they brought him out of retirement. His name was Flynn. Okay. So anyways, he took a hold of us 
took charge of me. And uh, the other guy that came aboard with me was named Zemecker. And he was okay, but he wasn't happy. I wasn't either. Here's a wooden ship. What am I going to do? You know, I saw these great big cannons. Uh, it was a... When I, you know, the mistake I think that society makes going back, society makes is there's not enough social studies, not enough history taught to these kids of today. They don't know. You ask a child today, what's the greatest war? They can't answer you because they don't know. Okay. But secondly, getting back to that, uh, they didn't know the history of the ship. And I liked history, so what I did is, all the time I was aboard this ship, I gained all the knowledge. One thing that people don't know is she was designed in 1797, 17, 17, 17, wait a minute, I gotta go back, 1779, I'm sorry, 1779. The guy, his name was Sir Joshua Humphreys, and he was the architect and the designer of their ship. And he came up with a bright idea. With, in, in them days, they used regular, probably regular dry wood. He came up with the idea of using green oak. The ship is entirely made up of green oak. And the only place at that time that you could get the green oak was South Carolina. Okay. So they did. They brought the wood in and they built her with his on um, this guy's design. And that's what she is. And that's why that the balls when the British fired at us with their cannons, they bounced off because oh the beams weren't dry. It was green oak. True. And that yeah. ship got a nickname because of that, right? And the ship got the nickname Old Ironside because the British, when it was in the fights, uh, she mainly was in 1812 when we got into a fight with England. Uh, the British nicknamed her Old Ironsides because the balls were bouncing off. Okay. Now, Getting back to the ship, uh, in 1945, uh, what happened is approximately 2,100 hours, which is about 9 o'clock at night. I was PO watch on the gangway. You had to have a PO and you had a regular seaman. And because all iron size was made of wood, they had fire watch. So this seaman would every hour on the hour would go down to different positions in the ship. And they had these old fashioned clocks that had with a key in room, and it was his job to put the key in and it would print the time that he went. Okay. And that was his job. And he'd come back up on top side. 20, nine, 9 o'clock at night, or 2100, I'm standing there on the gangway, and I have a log in front of me, and I have to log in when he comes back. I have to write his name, what time he got here. If anybody come on board ship, I had to log them in. That was my job. So I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, boom, just like this, I was pushed a distance from you, me to you, okay? What had happened is a tug had come in and back of us, a seagoing tug. And normally, uh, they c he was coming in too fast, and but he put it in reverse and couldn't stop in time. Now a tug has an awful bow, 
very strong, reinforced, and it smashed into the stern of old iron sights and pushed pushed her up. Re she was injured. So with you being uh, someone with a PO, I had I couldn't leave the game. I couldn't leave the gangway. I couldn't leave. I had I sent the seaman down to get the exec. When he come up all startled and such, he's trapped. It, where he slept was in where the stern of the ship is, okay? Uh, we had to free him, get him out. So I instructed him to go down and wake up the crew. So they did. I still could not leave the gangway. Could not do it. So I had to log it in, what time and what happened. And when they told me, informed me that a seagoing tug had rammed us in the stern, I had to put that down. Okay. When, and, with my, and I had to put my name <coughs> underneath it. Okay. Now, old Ironsides, when they built her, her whole hull is copper lined. And it was copper lined because Paul Revere, who was a, a metalsmith, had, had got the contract or whatever to put the copper on it. So they lined that with copper okay, over the oak. And he was his, uh, they said he uh, designed the brass that was on board ship. Uh, they had uh, a bell, uh, several uh, different things that were made of metal. That was his job. So he designed that, Paul Revere. Uh, I was very fascinated because of the history of it. Okay? Uh, very, what happened when, when we took the ship uh, they had to tow it to dry dock, put her in dry dock, reinforce her, and then check her out, check out the whole, the whole ship in the stern. They had to rebuild us, too. So once the ship gets fixed, where, where do you guys go from there? Well, then when the ship was repaired, they refloated her in the dry dock, they just flood it. And the tugs pulled her out and pulled her back down to, to Pier 1 in Charlestown. And there she sat. Okay. Now, the Navy got the bright idea because of World War II, this, the difference between uh, people were getting, you know, oh, well, you know, we're spending money, 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 you know. So the Navy says, well, why don't we show them what we got? So this ship, because of the history, was docked on Pier 1, a distance, I will say, between for the entrance of the shipyard, Charlestown, a distance probably from here across the road, guarded by Marines. So they invited people even during the war, and we were still in war with Japan, and and uh, I believe in June uh, of '45, I believe the the uh, war was over in Europe. Anyways, uh, when that was over, the Navy got the bright idea: well, we're going to bring people and let them see it because of the history of it. So they brought <coughs> people in. You could come in board through the entrance through the Marines to the ship, you you were, you know, guarded naturally because you're still at war. And you come aboard. Now we had uh, we got one morning, uh, we got orders. They're gonna have a college come aboard. And you're there this Wesley whole time. Wesley College. Wesley College. All girls. All girls. 
And that's the devil's grace for us guys, you know, oh boy, you know, you know. So, uh, he, so, there must have been about 30 of them come on. All nice young girls, pretty pictures, you know, oh boy, you know. So they came and they asked questions. We showed them. They could only go on the gun deck and the top side. They could not go down to the birth deck because you had to crew down there. Some would walk around in shorts, whatever. Yeah. And that was it. So uh, then p periodically people would come aboard, you know. Uh, so you pretty much stayed with the ship oh, yeah. during, yeah, I did during the whole the war. Because I was stuck because I was a carpenter. True. And there was a lot of repair on that ship. Uh, I had to maintain the gun forts had, uh, you've got the port itself and you've got the cannon poking through and you've got uh, approximately, I'd say almost, well maybe three or four foot thick gun port that would come down to close over in fall weather, they would, it would close down over the gun, say so that the water couldn't come in. It was my job to go and check every one of them out periodically, make sure they were okay. If there's any problems, I reported to the captain, and he reported to the uh, commander of the mm -hmm. shipyard, okay, who was a, uh, a captain. And uh, he was in charge of Every ship in the whole eastern part of the United States, in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, he knew where every ship was. Okay. That was it. So if you could go back and do it again, would you? Well, I mean, history-wise, I, I was just, I was fascinated. So by, it, it was a treat for you to be able to, yeah, because to I work on that ship. Buff. But I was disappointed because I tried to get in in 43. And I went from Utica to Albany. And so when I got there, I went before this doctor and I was two pounds under. And he said, well, I said, I was disappointed. He said, I can't, I can't accept you. I said to him, I, I want to get in. I'll tell you what you do. You go out to dinner, and if you come back with the two pounds, I'll pass you. So I went to the restaurant, and I said to the girl, I heard that bananas were fattening. So I said to the girl, do you have bananas? She said, yes. How many do you want? One, two? I said, give me 12. Two. She brings a big plate of bananas. I never was so sick in my life. I'm telling you. I went back, figuring I got it licked, so I'm going to break that two pounds. I was about two ounces under. Uh. He wouldn't pass me. But now I understood when I got to Samson, why? Because he, I would have never made it with my weight. True. Wow. But I tried in 43. Had I got in 43, I would have got into the war. I was disappointed. Yeah. But then I enlisted in 44 and went back in. Then the war was winding down because I enlisted in April, uh, right on my birthday. And uh, so I said to myself, well, the war's going down. At least they were still fighting in Japan. And I tried and I tried and I tried to get uh, transferred. Okay, because I wanted to get in the thick of it. Couldn't do it. They froze me. The Navy would not do it. I could not get past. I couldn't get past all iron sights. True. So I was a, a board, served a boarder and uh, I got discharged. You had points. If you have your points, uh, when your points are up, you're going to get discharged unless you want to re-enlist. I couldn't see three years 
as $88 a month. But that ain't too, too much money. So I said to myself, I'll go home and go to work. I can make more money that way. I couldn't see it. <gasps> that's, where, that's where it ended. True. They're called the greatest generation, men and women from all walks of life, who grew up in the Great Depression, led our nation to victory in World War II, and helped make America a beacon of freedom and democracy for all the world. And do they have some stories to tell? I'm pleased to be partnering with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center to preserve the words and memories of many of our World War II veterans these stories will be entered into the state's archives, where they will be accessible to researchers, academics, and future generations. Our veterans have given so much to help build a brighter future for all Americans. This tribute is just one small way of saying thank you. Some call them America's greatest generation, those who answered the call in World War II. Tonight, Military Matters reporter John Ward tells us how...